Welcome to Games Now. My name is Anna Kaisa Kultima, and this is Design Factory. And uh, Games Now, where we discuss different topics of games industry and game development, is an open lecture series. So this is open for everyone, and in order to get the full advantage of our lecture series, make sure that you follow us on YouTube and Facebook, and also on Twitter and Instagram. Um, games have become such a general medium for all kinds of stories and experiences. One of such utility areas is science games. However, marrying the complexities of science with the complexities of design is not always uh, an easy task, it's always a challenge. Today we explore one very timely topic of research, and that's nature conservation. Uh, and on top of that, we're going to reflect how to make a board game out of that topic. Today's speakers are from the University of Tampere, postdoctoral researcher Nina Nygren, and game designer and researcher Ville Kankainen. So let's start with Nina. Welcome to the stage. Is my mic on? Yes. Thank you for, for this opportunity. My name is Nina Nygren. I'm a researcher in environmental policy in Tampere University. So um, this was the first game design project I was involved in. <laughs> and uh, it wasn't easy. And now I will tell you a bit why and how, how it worked. And I will first... Um, talk about the, um, the content, the topic of the game, nature conservation and biodiversity offsetting. And Ville will talk more about the design choices after me. Um, so uh, we started a bit more than two years ago um, with the research project funding and we the game is a card game which is an education game serious game simulation game all of these i don't know which is the best one to describe <laughs> our game maybe villa knows that better and uh, we see that our game is a, is a research output it's science communication so in addition to writing articles or having a website, we made also a game. And we thought a lot about how to communicate about this subject through the game, what choices to make. Um, and then we have used it to facilitate discussion on biodiversity offsetting, especially in Finland, because it's a new tool in nature conservation uh, it's not yet in the Finnish legislation, uh, so we thought when we were making this application for this project that uh, especially Finnish experts on land use planning and nature conservation, they need to learn what is and what it can be and what it should not be, <laughs> biodiversity offsetting. Uh, and uh, we hope that this game has helped them to think about it and will help them to think about it. And um, so we have played it with stakeholders. And so it has been also a research tool because we have filmed these sessions and we are analyzing them now and, and we'll write at least one article, no, two articles about this. And um, so the main audience was the experts who will soon in Finland encounter biodiversity offsetting in their work, forestry or land use planning and, and nature conservation. Uh, but we also have played with students and it has worked quite well uh, in there too. I will tell a bit more about that later. But very shortly about the project, so we got funding from Kone Foundation. They had a special theme call uh, in 2017 on biodiversity offsetting. And uh, we got the funding with, with many other offsetting projects. And we have a website and Facebook and Twitter. 
and um, we have a multidisciplinary team and um, Ville was the only one with any game <laughs> design <laughs> experience or, or very not very much game experience uh, any kind of in, in the team but um, anyway so we are two environmental policy researchers and an illustrator and then we have ecology and public law and literature and who have uh, helped us in, in making the game. And then I want to be clear about the <laughs> matter that it's not about carbon offsetting. Many times when we have invited people to let's play our offsetting game that they have thought it's about carbon offsetting because it's very much talked about these days, uh, at least in the Finnish media, but it's not about that. Uh, it's not about offsetting uh, personal flights or anything, so it's more about often about big projects um, and in land use planning such as roads, railroads, mines or factories or, or uh, um, apartment uh, buildings that will be built on top of some nature that is seen valuable. And the, the point of offsetting is that um, if there's, for example, a mine that will destroy some uh, um, forest lake and then it, they will do restoration and conservation efforts of something similar, uh, lake or a pond or forest or build boxes for bats or flying squirrels and, and these kind of things. So it means that they uh, find out what kind of nature gets destroyed because of the project and they try before it's destroyed to restore similar nature possibly nearby. That's the basic dynamic, but it's uh, quite uh, complicated. And, um, but I will go a bit back now to why uh, nature conservation and biodiversity matters. It's maybe nothing very new to you, but still I would like to go through these points. You have probably seen these alarming headlines lately uh, about declining biodiversity and, and some experts say that it's worse than climate change because climate can change back, but we can never have back the extinct species. And there are many ways to um, draw uh, images of the seriousness of the situation. I have chosen a couple here. This is uh, cumulative extinctions of, of evaluated species. So of course bigger species are more prominent there. And the line, dotted line in the below is the normal natural uh, background extinction because of course species go extinct also for natural reasons, but the rate of extinction now is, is really alarming as, and it's because of humans. And the other way to show what we are doing to nature is to show the biomass of, of land mammals. Here we can see that the, the dark gray is humans and the light gray is livestock and, and uh, pets. And so we have re basically replaced uh, biomass of land animals with our cells and our, our animals and the wild animals are only the uh, green dots left. So it's no wonder that <laughs> uh, biodiversity is, is declining. And the main drivers of biodiversity loss, this is from uh, a global assessment last year that where they ranked uh, globally these threats and the first one is changes in land use and sea use and this is what we simulate in our game actually the changes of, of land use like I said building roads or mines or converting forests to something else and uh, why does the <laughs> loss of biodiversity matter well it has been said that losing biodiversity is like losing rivets on an airplane uh, you never know which is the um, last one uh, which will make the plane fall, so you it's better not to experiment too much. At least I wouldn't want to be on that kind of 
flight. So uh, let's try to keep all the species on board. And um, the way conservation, nature conservation is seen in environmental policy is that it's a social practice uh, and it's always different from place to place. So one solution is not uh, fit for every, every different place. The, there's a different kind of history of each place. The spe nature is different, the, the local people are different, there's different practices of land use and conservation, different kind of laws and institutions. So it's, it varies from place to place, which also makes it complicated and hard to find easy solutions. And uh, therefore, the nature conservation falls into the category of wicked problems. I don't know if you have heard about this concept before. Um, uh, it comes from, from the 70s and it has been used a lot in many spheres and also in resolving environmental problems. Um, it means that the, there are different understandings of what the problem is and what is the cause. What is exactly the cause of, for example, the insect decline? Is it more about land use change or the, or the, uh, the substances that we use in agriculture? It's not known completely. And then there are many causal levels. Every wicked problem can be considered to be a symptom of another problem. When the birds are declining, that's a symptom of, of insects declining partially, and the insect decline can be a symptom of, of land use changes and so on. And uh, usually there's no consensus, especially when you go in decision-making level, what should be done about these problems. Uh, who who get who who takes the uh, economic loss for for the for the any decisions made and so on and there's often uncertainty knowledge can be lacking or or expert expert opinion is is challenged so it's not easy to make decisions and uh, then the solutions are continually evolving and it's not clear when the problem is solved and and uh, well, nature conservation has been been around, let's say, for 200 years. So it's clear that the problem is not <laughs> yet really solved. And uh, um, there's, as I said, no single solution that applies in all circumstances. There's no one magic wand that uh, can. Uh, make a solution for, for all the biodiversity loss everywhere, from every species and every, every place. And there's often no objective way to determine what is a good decision. Uh, if you make two drastic decisions, the locals might be, uh, uh, they might not want to do what you, what, uh, what the law says and whatever. So it has to be fine an agreement with them, for example. So and how to do that, it's, it's not clear. And often there's not a shared set of values that would help in decision making. And there's no clear responsibilities necessarily. And uh, different understandings of the rules of decision making. Who uh, make, can make the decisions and who is responsible for, for the decisions. And uh, of course, all, not all of these are always present when there's a nature conservation dispute, but these are the properties of, of wicked problems. And this is kind of how we see nature conservation. We didn't uh, want to portray it too simply in our game. And uh, now I can tell you a bit more detail about biodiversity offsetting. If you see the BDO, that's when we, what we mean, we say it means <laughs> biodiversity offsetting. And um, um, what it is, it links the destruction and the degradation of nature 
to restoration and conservation of efforts elsewhere. So um, it has to be quantified and measured, which means that not all the damage and, and destruction is not measured usually. They use a special protected species or a list of certain habitats because it's impossible to map the whole biodiversity of any place that gets destroyed, for example, for uh, some mine or something. And then it's linked to restoration and conservation efforts elsewhere. So there's usually the one who destroys pays for the restoration or conservation elsewhere, or they do it themselves, or they buy credits from a biodiversity bank. The practices can be different, uh, and each one of them has their problems. Uh, and, uh, but this creates, anyway, uh, fungibility of biodiversity values. So if you destroy one natural forest pond here and uh, build uh, five artificial ponds, uh, let's say, 20 kilometers away, is that the same? Does it uh, offset the same values or not? Uh, and um, and how much should it cost, and, 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 and uh, will there be a market that someone else offers uh, seven pawns, but further away, and is that better or worse than the five closer by, and all these kinds of very complex uh, problems when it comes to exchanging uh, values and trying to decide are they the same, how can you uh, Sometimes you usually try to offset the destroyed nature with the same kind of nature, but sometimes it's not possible. So, is the uh, can you offset flying squirrels by building bat boxes or something? It's uh, it's they are not easy questions, and they are not there are no easy answers. And some uh, oppose biodiversity offsetting for these reasons that every place is so unique that. Uh, these kind of markets distort the whole meaning of, of, of nature. And uh, there are some hopes and expectations when it comes to biodiversity offsetting. It's fairly new conservation tool. It has been used in USA and Europe for for longer period, and it's only now coming to Sweden and Finland. And um, so there are both uh, good and bad experiences already, but there are also hopes and expectations. Uh, so developers and planners who want to build a mine or a road or something, they hope that offsetting makes construction easier. They want to build their project and, and make money or make a sustainable society, for, for example, by windmills or whatever. Uh, and they hope that it's easier because sometimes the protected species can can uh, stall or or even stop development in some places. Like um, Finnish people might probably heard about flying squirrels that have uh, slowed down uh, projects here. So the hope is that now that it's easy to buy. Uh, flying squirrel credits or restoration elsewhere. This way, it's much easier to build uh, roads or other kind of projects. And the same goes for other kind of habitats and species that used to be problematic for, for development because they are protected and valued and so on. But on the other hand, then the conservationists, um, they hope that offsetting would make destruction of nature more expensive and more difficult because they see the crisis and, and they would want them to think more, is this project really necessary? Does it have to be there? Can it be elsewhere? Can it be smaller? And if the restoration for the offsetting, if it costs a lot, then they may, might start thinking more that is the project really necessary? And, and uh, can it be made in a way that it l does less harm? And the other hope <laughs> for conservation is that uh, there's a lot of degraded habitats, for example, um, uh, drained wetlands in Finland, which would need restoration funds, and they hope that 
uh, the offsetting projects would give funds for restoration. So if someone destroys a wetland here, they would give funds for, for restoring a wetland that has already been destroyed before and restore that. So there are many even conflicting expe expectations when it comes to offsetting. And um, there are also fears and risks. Many fear that is it, it's greenwashing. You just buy yourself out of the conservation obligations and uh, just give someone money and they will do the offsetting for you and you don't have to take care about any of the species on your way. Uh, and some fear that it, it means the selling of unique biodiversity values because every place is, is really unique. Can you really uh, replace one, one, uh, the biodiversity values in one place with creating values elsewhere when the place is always unique? And uh, this is why Many conservationists oppose the whole idea of offsetting. And the um, aim of, of biodiversity offsetting is no net loss of bio biodiversity in any point of the process. So before destroying here, you should already have restored in the other place the same values. But it, uh, in practice, it doesn't usually happen this way. The authorities might not... Um, uh, that might give you permission to destroy already before you have shown that the restoration has taken place, the offsetting has taken place, or the process itself is very slow and so on, or there are a lot of uncertainties because um, mm, we don't know enough about species and habitats, how to restore them. And um, even if we think we know, they still the projects might fail and, and uh, it's a very complicated thing to do, which is also one reason that it would be better to save the ones we have instead of trying to restore new things. But these are conflicting thoughts in the conservation world. So how did we frame all of this in the game where we can take only very uh, a limited set of thoughts and things and ideas to the game? and? Uh, we used the concept of frames and framing by, by Goffman. Um, why haven't I even mentioned it there? Anyway, um, yes, frames are a ways to understand and analyze the world to create and communicate meanings and beliefs. And they influence what gets discussed and how. So we wanted to be careful how we frame conservation and offsetting in the game. We did not want to frame it too positively or only negatively in the game. And we want to, to show how complicated conservation is. And um, so we framed basically conservation as a wicked problem. In the game, um, there's no clear solutions to the problem. The game has... Um, um, two camps, developers and conservationists, and the developers try to build the natural area and the conservationists try to block it. And Ville will tell more about the, the details of the game. And, uh, but there's no one solution how the, how, how the game is played that is uh, the best solution to, to win the game or anything like that. So we try to make the players think and discuss the, the setting and the dynamics more than trying to learn one solution, how to do things right. And we also created the quite strong conflict be between development and conservation, um, maybe even stronger than what we think <laughs> that it is in reality, uh, because it's also possible to do, um, I mean, nature lives alongside with us in, in the urban areas and so on. But we had to simplify things for the game, and we created a quite strong conflict here. And that's also something that the players, we hope, they will discuss. Do they believe in such a strong, strong conflict? And then we wanted to put offsetting in a context of nature conservation and development. Because uh, we played also with some stakeholders in France, 
and France has also already a legislation on offsetting. And, uh, and uh, they were expecting a game that would uh, explain how to do offsetting process well. Uh, but our game is not that kind of a game. <laughs> um, it's not the, it doesn't teach a technical procedure of offsetting. It teaches a bit of it, but uh, not all of it. And we thought it would have been maybe a boring game, <laughs> also that kind of uh, game. Uh, so we wanted to to show the power structures and, and conflicts around offsetting, why it is a contested uh, concept. And a couple of slides about our solutions in the game. We have a narrative, uh, which will be written in, in the guidebook. And the narrative goes that the, the tiles that we put on the table, 25 nature, tiles with some of which have species. It's the last natural area inside an urban area, so we try to create this um, sense of urgency for the conservation players that they really want to save it. And if the species are lost from the table, they go originally extinct. And um, then there are some rare species that can't be offset, so they are real obstacles for, for development in the game because also in reality they can be species that have lived maybe only in two or three places in the whole world. And if you try destroy that and try to replant the, the flowers elsewhere, it might not work. And then you have lost one third of the whole world population. Uh, that's not uh, a very nice uh, thing to do, to, to experiment on. And um, some things about how we, uh, examples how we how we put the wickedness there, and we will we'll talk more about it. That we th we um, the offsetting is not necessarily a good solution in the game, and we hope that the players will think about uh, if it is according to them. And some players will think that it is, and others will not. And and we think that this is a very important discussion after the game, which is. Uh, essential, essential for an education game that there's a discussion afterwards. And um, then we have also sustainable projects and profitable projects which the developer players can choose from, but the sustainable proje projects are not different in their effects on the, on the nature. So they destroy nature in the same way because also wind power plants are built often in the forest and they have to cut a lot of forest uh, to, to build them and so on. So we wanted to show how even sustainable uh, projects uh, have these effects on biodiversity when they are built. Then, of course, there are other, other effects which are not in our game. And then we have power in, uh, inequalities. Um, Maybe Ville will talk about that a bit more, but some players can do uh, the development and the others have can only wait and try to oppose that, basically. And then uh, we have um, different roles in the game, but, but I took especially these two roles because they are the controversial roles in the game. And... Um, we want the players to discuss uh, these things. How can they do that? Can they really do that? You're supposed to be sustainable. Can you do help the the other developer or or do this evil thing in the game? And uh, or the there are conservationists who like offsetting, and there are conservationists who who oppose offsetting. And we have wanted to. Um, at some point of the each session, usually someone starts to think whose side is that conservationist on, because it's can they can also help the developers and 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 these are conflicts that also exist inside the conservation community in real life. So we wanted to uh, simulate these things there too. 
And then we have scarcity of av available land and correct habitats because it happens, for example, already in France that uh, some development happens in some rare habitat and it might be hard to find same kind of habitat and the landowner who really wants to sell you that land or do the restoration for you. And well, then offsetting is a complicated process in our game, probably a bit too complicated, but uh, our game is not perfect, so. Uh, but that's usually what <laughs> the first thing that people <laughs> remember from the game is that offsetting is, is complicated and long process. And it is in real life too. And then we have some surprises and uncontrollability. And for example, you need to roll a dice to see if offsetting is successful. And we wanted to bring uh, with this some the unpredictability of nature, because you can do all your best restoration efforts with your best knowledge and still it might fail. So uh, uh, there's these kind of elements. And my last slide, something preliminary. It was uh, quite fun to find out that also in, in design is thought as a, as a wicked problem in itself. So it <laughs> fits uh, well together. And um, when we played with the stakeholders, we were happy that we were able to simulate uh, right things in the in the offsetting process and conservation and development because the stakeholders who know their stuff they recognized familiar events uh, sorry elements but of course they always would want to add many things that can't fit in the game so uh, we took something and but it's not possible to have everything we can't simulate <laughs> the <laughs> world as it is, and we can't make everyone happy, but uh, it has been... Uh, uh, we have also used uh, these gaming sessions with stakeholders as, as um, that we take uh, the comments that this and this thing is missing. It's also a research result, because they, they react with our game, and, and, uh, and um, it's interesting which each stakeholder group, they might notice different things missing. So, and uh, and now that we are about to print the game, um, it it's not perfect. The design could be simpler, and it uh, could have been done in a different way, and everything. So, um, uh, maybe our next game <laughs> will be better, <laughs> and maybe we will develop this further. Who knows? And. Um, and the other thing that we were happy anyway, that the discussions and thought of thoughts of, of players when we played with stakeholders or students, they were the kind of discussions that we were aiming for. They were discussing about the roles, they were discussing about offsetting and, and development. And um, so um, in that way, we I would like to say that we had some success <laughs> with the with the game, I would say. And uh, yeah, that's my part today. And then Ville will tell more details. Looks and Veras, of course. Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Ville Kankainen, and yeah, I was, uh, I'm a uh, game researcher and a PhD student in uh, Tampere University, currently also working in Alta University in this Games Now project. And uh, yeah, I'm doing my PhD on uh, how digital media is used in tabletop gaming cultures and so on. I also have a background in uh, game design, or uh, game designer, and so I have uh, done there some some pictures of uh, projects I've been involved with, do some sport game and some educational digital games as well, and and 
these kind of uh, workshop being participatory game design projects where we have been uh, designing games with uh, with uh, young people and so on also yeah uh, member of Finnish board game uh, Finnish game jam organization and uh, how did I got involved in this project well first I was asked to to give a lecture on uh, board games or board game design early on on the on the project when there was a this course for students to design and design uh, this kind of offsetting board game and then as like maybe a couple of lectures and uh, I ended up co-designing the course and helping with that and lots of different <laughs> roles that I ended up in this uh, project and uh, even there's like a yeah board game project this kind of project also the yeah the focus was to develop the the game but also there are lots of uh, elements involved in this kind of research project so there was need for need for different skills and I could fill in on those so a little bit about the game Nina already told you told you something about that Here's a picture of our uh, almost latest prototype of the game, the game setup. So it's about biodiversity offsetting, as came clear already. And uh, there are two factions, conservationists and developers. And developers are trying to build projects. And while doing so, they are destroying nature. You can see the nature ties, the green ones there. There's unexplored nature and you have to explore the nature, do surveys to find out species and if there are or are there some species, empty nature maybe. If there are species you have to offset them and this uh yeah the game uh, describes the it's not only about the offsetting process, it's uh, like a different stakeholders and aspects involved in it so it's there's lots of elements in this game like Nina told there is this story that this is the last piece of nature in the middle of uh, of urban area and and uh, yeah player actions are a little bit different depending on the role that you are playing conservationists or developers like uh, developers are they are more active in a sense that they are building stuff and conservationists are are responding to that and uh, <clears throat> so it's uh, an unequal set of uh, actions they have there and uh, they score you score points in the game the both both camps or factions score points and the one with the most point win and uh, developers get points by building project while conservationists get points by conducting offsetting or founding uh, conservation areas and so on. The, how did we start the, the design process? This, when I got in, it was already going on, the design process, and uh, it was about uh, the first stages as usual, it was like benchmarking what kind of games there are about these environmental or sustainability issues and uh, some that uh, we have uh, tried out Baumland, these are not these games are not exactly the same biodiversity offsetting topic that we have but similar kind of uh, games and this Baumland is based on uses same kind of tile mechanics and it's more about uh, land use and uh, such things so there are different kind of uh, serious games about these environmental or sustainability issues out there. Keep Cool, that's about uh, global warming. Then Katan Oil Springs, so which is an add-on to Katan, very popular board game. 
and uh, also made by, re made by researchers. So there are these scientific takes on, on, on like these uh, entertainment board games as well. And there are also a picture playing Terraforming Mars, which is entertainment game, but also have these kind of topics. And uh, by yeah, the early on the project, it was playing different kinds of games, finding what kind of uh, solutions did they have on uh, these games and how could we utilize these different mechanics in our game. And uh, from early on in this kind of project, it's, it wasn't so much of like a finding out first an interesting game mechanics and then building on that. Because in serious game projects, you have uh, certain key features that you want to have there. Like here, of course, offsetting process should be in the game in some form. Then polarization as there are opposing, opposing sides and people have very different views on, on the offsetting in general. And uh, what was also wanted was to have uh, players to maybe step on someone else's differing faction that they are themselves in their role and uh, maybe learning something through that. That was why we had uh, also these uh, roles where our characters were important feature in the game. And uh, yeah, like I said, there are no single solutions, so these are like a wicked, wicked problem. And uh, game design always is a, there is always this uh, same issue that you, you, can't, you don't have single solution that is the best way to represent stuff. There are lots of, lots of ways of doing, doing things. And this is the, yeah, some pictures of our design process from early on when we have a quite different type of uh, prototype than our current game, which uses, and the current game we use a deck of cards as a, they are as currency in the game, so it's like hand management stuff that you pay for actions you do in the game with the cards. But these early versions, we still, there was like a, we are looking what kind of elements there should be, which would be the best ways of uh, representing this offsetting topic. And also the interesting aspect is uh, that we had this, uh, the design process, we had sometimes these uh, uh, online meetings with uh, one of our key team members, member who was most of the time in France. So we had these even game test sessions where one person was uh, online and we had a laptop on the table and so on. So these are like a, well, reality is in this kind of project where there's lots of people involved and you have to be creative how to test stuff. And I think it does work quite well, although obviously it's not that easy to play, but we had different copies of the game. And I think in some sessions we even, he was playing on that end and had some cards and so on. And In any case, like Nina described this uh, biodiversity offsetting, it's a complex process. And uh, serious game simulating this process, it's never easy, easy task to do because there are, when you start getting into it, there are lots of, eleme lots of elements and everything affects everything as is also the case in any kind of game as a system. And uh, I think that is maybe something that is uh, easily in this kind of project. If you don't have a design experience, it's, uh, it's not so easy to understand how complex process it is actually to simulate stuff and do this kind of uh, games. And so one important thing here is to understand the, the game is a system which is a, acts as a metaphor for another kind of system. And uh, recognizing all these different, uh, 
different uh, elements of these systems and how you could, uh, could uh, describe or, or represent different elements of uh, biodiversity offsetting in this game system. And uh, there always comes the problem with uh, simulations that uh, what is the good enough level of fidelity in the simulation. And this is something that we came up many times during the project that which elements we necessarily need to have in this game and uh, which can be abstracted away. And then here I have an example that is maybe one game that is uh, maybe the most complex Second World War simulation game that's a board game that average playing time is 1,500 hours. So you can go to very deep level in details. There, I think there was a, there was detailed even uh, the drinking water that the soldiers have in the field and everything because it's in North Africa. And so, yeah, it's lots of choices that when you are doing uh, this kind of research project, the topic is always important. And for the researchers, there are lots of important elements. So it's very hard decisions what kind of elements can you drop or abstract away. Here is uh, one list about uh, different elements in uh, biodiversity offsetting, which are all important points to communicate and to understand, but understandably it's very difficult to have e this everything in one game if you don't want to have this kind of game that lasts hundreds of hours. So we had to make decisions. And also, when designing a serious game, you don't have maybe the normal audience of uh, entertainment games, where you can expect that the audience is familiar with games and they are interested in playing games, and so on. So you have to think, well, always in design, it's important to understand the target audience, but here also the like in which kind of situation you are going to play the game because the context matters here here so for example our game when during the process it was played with the stakeholders we had kind of a game master or kind of guided play situation but that is something that you need to decide like a, hopefully early on at which kind of situation it is played because, well, that of course affects the level of details you can have in the simulation and so on. And how to engage people who are non-gamers. That is also how to design the game elements, the game system such way that it's easy to engage with if you're not so familiar with games. And how long should the game last, and so on. So it's not as much about creating a recreational game, but there are lots of different roles for, for ser serious games. And like, do you want to com sci do science communication for public audiences, maybe in conventions, and so on, and how long can it last? How how difficult or com complex rules could you have? And, and so on. And uh, then we come to the, the issue of how to implement the learning content in the game. Obviously, you want to have something in the mechanics, as I thought about, to having a simula simulating a uh, complicated real life system, but also the aesthetic aspects there, like we have uh, pictures of nice animal pictures and everything. How do people engage with that? And does it bring out some emotions, and stuff like that? We also had in our prototype version lit actual lithium rocks, which were used to, to describe where or represent a mine or place for mine on the game board, so that kind of things.
can be can be done as well. But then again, the game mechanics, because obviously, well, you can have lots of different kind of mechanics to describe or act as a metaphors for real life situations or elements, but how easy it is to really understand these metaphors, metaphors if you expect that people are playing only one time, not going that deep into the game, and do they really communicate that well? And even if there was like a reasoning for every single mechanics you have in the game. And uh, like, yeah, we had also had this narrative in this game. It is, uh, it comes through several ways. There are some uh, story piece in the rule book about the starting point of the game. So on something that, that is very common in board games, in general, to frame the situation. Then also we have a narrative pieces describing the species we have in the game and so on. But also how people are creating narratives, what they are playing, what happens in the game. That is, so like a, how much do we want to guide them to certain kind of narratives and how, how to implement certain kind of elements. Of course, you can never design the final experience, but Yeah, here are the, the roles. There were like there are three different uh, conservationists and uh, six different uh, developers in the game. In the game, and they, they represent the, like was said already, the divide and or the factions here in the game. And uh, there is a uh, you can see the narrative already put into this. Uh, these roll cards, we had this short text in the beginning describing what kind of stereotypes these, uh, these roles or characters are and uh, their goal and mood. So these are kind of uh, role-playing aid in the game. But also this is uh, the approach taken in these roll cards is uh, similar than you see in several entertainment games, but then the, it is kind of approach, it, it, it was interesting how it came like a, the question which is more important, the game mechanical information or the narrative fluff text that we have here and, uh, and uh, how to organize this in correct way. So there was a, like, a dual role for these cards to describe the role or helping the players to get into the role. But also using this as a, as a game mechanical help for describing the, how to score points and so on. And uh, in the design, it came obvious players always have different, different types of ways of playing, so do the players really engage with the narrative stuff or play the role or do they just play against the mechanics in the game? So how useful it is to, to describe all these, uh, these uh, roles and so on. How does the message that we want to code into the game really come true? And of course, here again, the, the context matters. If you have a, this gui guide or game master during the session, you can, then you can uh, describe the situation and bring and guide the players to get into the role, for example, and so on. But that was also the, like a design choice that we wanted to have there, this kind of role playing element in the game, although it's very much a board game. Yeah, what is uh, relevant, what can be learned, that was exactly the, yeah, the, what kind of elements should be abstracted away and uh, does players really learn something 
for every single element there. There have been, yeah, design is always about choices, like uh, there's lots of stuff we would have wanted to be in this game, and we have lots of discussions uh, about wh what is the message of the game that we want to convey. And uh, I think this uh, went uh, deeper into the actual, the, the discussion went deeper into the, the values that uh, we want this game to represent than in, if you design a more commercial game, where you can be like a, going with mechanics that on some level maybe simulate real life actions and stuff like that. But in this, uh, there was a, there had to be this uh, like metaphorical level or what kind of message we want to come out of this. And uh, it was all about like how we understand the biodiversity of setting and uh, also this uh, critical approach because it's never, it's not just like a simulation in that sense that you can just objectively simulate something. We have a clear critical take on the, on the biodiversity of setting that you can see through all the roles and how things work in the game. And uh, there were lots of yeah, discussions which way we want to go here. And also there was like, a, inside the research team, there was different uh, ways people saw, saw this, uh, or had different values or different ways of seeing what is important in the process and so on. So there are lots of this discussion, what could be, or should be implemented in the, in the game. And uh, as we also, as the process was also participatory design, in a sense that uh, during the prototype stage, we played several times with the particip or our stakeholders who are going to engage with the offsetting in their work or otherwise. So we wanted to engage those stakeholders in the process to partly to create ownership for the game, to have them maybe buying our game, but also the, one of the key issues here is the topic expertise, that when you're designing this kind of serious game, there is all, always, it's a combination of uh, game design and uh, how to balance with game design and the topic matter and so on, and we wanted to have these different, uh, different views also on the design elements of the game, in addition to, to using it as a research tool to discuss with these issues with the stakeholders. So we got research data, but we also got feedback on the design elements, and there are lots of discussions, how should things be described or represented in the game. But what the, this meant for the, the design process is that we needed very early on a visual prototype instead of just doing, going with uh, fast and ugly prototypes. Because playing with, uh, with the outsiders, you have to have a little bit better looking, looking game than just hand-drawn cards and so on. And also, as the process was still ongoing, this were, that was one reason for this guided play situation that it was the uh, best way of uh, doing, doing these uh, workshops or, and uh, of course it affect, affects how easy it is to learn the game because there is someone to teaching it instead of players engaging themselves and, and uh, this kind of uh, situation, this is a, uh, time consuming in a sense that you have to organize all these workshops so it uh, affects the design process altogether. In this kind of project, you can't just focus on the game design itself. There are lots of different aspects in the research project and even though the game is on the center of the project, it's still uh, 
still just one part of this whole whole project. So there's lots of this time restraint. And uh, yeah, and this uh, participatory, in, at least in this project, they were in that sense are not a real test situation as we had these research goals and everything involved. So then you have to have design or yeah, feedback, actual game test sessions in addition to these. And uh, yeah, our game has been during the project, as I said, been lots of about being a research tool to engage with representing biodiversity of setting to these stakeholders and discussing it. And, and, uh, and like uh, Nina was already talking about the framing, that uh, we have certain frames, certain way of understanding biodiversity of setting that we have encoded into the game and how do players react to this and how do they see the the offsetting through our games and and yes, lots of feedback. Feedback that's helping to develop the game, but also also for the, not always so, maybe not so helpful for the design pro process as the, there are obviously conflicting feedback as people see the topic very differently and, and it's, it requires lots of effort to balance all this. And in this kind of project where I've been, I was the only one who had some uh, design experience when going into this project. So in this kind of project, it's important to understand what is the role of the game design itself. Like uh, there could be different kind of project where it, it, is the, the design process itself important. For here, it has definitely helped when you have to always through, through the design process, you have to think the, or frame the situations differently, the real life topics and understand the key elements there and everything. So. It is. It can be like a learning tool in itself, also. Or is the game designed to be a learning tool, or what is the the role for the design? How important it is for the overall project. But what is also coming here that uh, I ended up teaching game design in this project as well. So it uh, requires uh, also more time when you have uh, people who have, haven't been so much involved in uh, game design prior to the, to the project. And, uh, but, uh, yeah. and as we have uh, this uh, key issue that we want to cover in the game, there can be this problem, a little bit this problem designed by committee as uh, people have different views, what is important in the game, and it might be sometimes difficult to implement all of all these elements, and it takes lots of time to, to test and try out all these uh, elements and uh, find out the best way for the design. So it's not, yeah, it's not the most streamlined uh, pro process in this type of project, the design itself. But uh, some lessons learned, something that I've been considering, my, at least personally, in this project is that, uh, well, design thinking is a skill and it can be learned. And uh, that is something that has come very, very clear in this kind of project. But what would be the best way to actually teach it in this kind of uh, situation where you have to actually, it's not so much about basically just about the teaching, but you have to teach it while, while similarly trying to create the product. And uh, in general, in, uh, in a serious game design, it's very important to internalize the, what is the function for the game in this, this exact 
project or where is it going to be played and with what kind of audience and everything. But also the, me well, the message of the game and also the content matter because for the design you have to really know the content really well to be able to convey it to game on game mechanics. And time management, that is something, well, it's always important, but like a, what kind of, a, when there is lots of different elements going on in this type of projects, it's what kind of things can be achieved in a certain time frame, and you have to consider how much time goes, for example, the graphic design element in board game, if you want it to be professional looking, it can take a lot of time. You need lots of uh, pictures and visual elements for the game and everything. So lots of these issues that should be considered very early on that you have reserved enough time for everything. And also the design as a learning process in this kind of uh, topic. I have learned lots of biodiversity of setting during during the design process. It's always like a, I think even if you know the topic matter, you learn new, new elements when you're doing the design and uh, going through all these, these uh, different elements and what is important there. What is the, you have to understand what is the key message you want to convey and how you could do that then. And, uh, get all this feedback and reflection also from other, other parties. Yeah, that was pretty much it. Here are some, you already saw these, website and other social media links. And thank you for listening. Uh, so thank you for Ville and Dina. Let's just go to the stage with chairs so we can have a comfortable spot for uh, questions and answers. Maybe we need to take this. What's yeah. Ville Nostas and Alassi? Siit on teille vedet sitten. Are we well positioned? Is it okay? <laughs> we are in the Light. screen. Okay? Yeah. From the production team. We fit in the screen. Good. Okay. All right. So thank you. That's like super interesting. I've been engaged with uh, science games productions myself, and it's definitely not an easy process. So I'm going to ask something first uh, to start the discussion. And you can. All of you can also think about questions there in the audience, and there are also student questions here. Uh, so we have a lot to talk. <laughs> but um, since, uh, Nina, you've been working with such a complex research topic, uh, with different stakeholders uh, and hugs and pulls everywhere, and then at the same time, the complexities of the, of the game design is kind of putting you into an added uh, challenge when you have to actually have answers, potentially to the things that you might not have an answer for so that you can build a game system. So have you learned something of your own research topic while doing this two-year journey mm. with, with, uh, with the project of designing mm. the game? Yeah, that's a good question. I've been studying nature conservation conflicts before, so all the stakeholders and their um, more or less attitudes and things like that were familiar, so that was not completely new. And uh, then we had um, a French researcher who did his own case study in France on an offsetting case. So we l got some new empirical material from there also, but I think what the game, making the game really learned that we had to simplify so much and, and put it really choose and, and kill the darlings and <laughs> things like that and, and to I think it has helped a lot to to somehow flesh out what I think about 
offsetting much better than if I would have done something else with the whole material. So in the sense the game design was for you also science communication mm -hmm. practice that can be turned into other than game stuff. Yeah, like yes, talks and stuff. Yes, and somehow a tool of analysis. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then added to that, you uh, briefly talked about that you used it as a research tool. So like what kind of can can you actually explore that slightly more or can mm. I explain? In what sense research tool in a way that not just learning and teaching through the game but actually doing mm. research. So how how is that? Uh yeah, we will we have started a bit already, but we have finished it analyzing the material. And uh, I have done analysis of group discussions before, so it's somehow similar, but it's uh, it's a new kind of group discussion material, and we will study um, how uh, Lucas will be the main author of writing about how the how what kind of emotions are present when the the stakeholders play the game, and what kind of emotional um, frames did we put the game and how they react to these, and then we will uh, try to analyze how they frame the um, subject matter of offsetting and nature conservation, the different kind of stakeholders. So the game is like a trigger material for mm. the for the chat or in a group yeah, and yeah, and yeah. to kind of expose things through that. Yeah. Yeah. Will it did that add another layer of uh, complexity for the design, or was it like actually just a natural side project of the of testing the game in different ways? Yeah, I think that uh, did add uh, another another layer there because there are yeah different uh, context that you're going to play the game. Like uh, that was one of the main goals in the project to use them in this kind of workshop, but then also at the same time you try to design the the final product and uh, you have to take into consideration how does it work in these kind of workshop situations where you first play the game by one of the researchers is a guide to play the game and then there is uh, this group discussion after the game session and where we have certain set of questions and uh, discussing these with the players and so on where we get the, our main data for the project so yeah, definitely. It's uh, also like, a, do we want to have this kind of research element in the in the final product, and uh, how do we frame that, and uh, do we have certain set of questions for players, and so on. So, yeah, there's definitely lots of elements here. So also, uh, I don't. I'm not sure if I if you had a slide on this, but. Uh, the main audience and the kind of users, the end users of the game, are, are, is it used in the homes of people or is it used in the institutions? How does it work with this product? Um, probably not in homes. Um, at least we hope the experts that we played with and similar kind of stakeholders, land use plans, uh, planners and conservation experts and, and forestry experts might play the game in their work life somehow or, or some coffee break or <laughs> long coffee break mm. Mm. <laughs> and uh, and uh, it we have tried experimented with it in in university teaching teaching about nature conservation but also about um, corporate social responsibility so um, at least in these these yeah. Uh, settings yeah definitely and yeah those experts are the ma main target audience, but then there have been like a, when it hasn't been so clear in which kind of context it should be played, and that has been also a difficult, like a, to what level do we need, want to feel stuff and, and uh, what kind of stuff to include in the game. So it's very important to consider the target audience, but it's sometimes I think it's difficult because the context can vary a lot and people have different ways of using these kind of tools. As a, as a teaching or mm -hmm. whatever, yeah. So in the game, is there like one set of rules or is there a couple of ways to play it or is it that it's up to the people to decide on the house rules? How does it work? There, there is a one set of rules to play it and there's some suggestions that are... Optional. Yeah, mm -hmm. couple of op optional rules, but mainly there is a one way of playing the game. And, and we have 
will write suggestions for debriefing questions, what to discuss mm. after the game. So in a sense, it's all also the, the research stuff is traveling into the final mm -hmm. product. Yeah, yeah. There is a yeah. discussion yeah. Uh, kind of triggers there. Yeah. 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 Excellent. Any questions from the audience at this point? Okay, just uh, think about it a little bit more. Um, I am going to then move into the kind of um, the focus. You talked about that there is like simplification and you have to do a lot of design decisions and, and also Villa had to teach a bit <laughs> of, the, mm. of what, what the design process is, uh, is about. But how did you, like can you explore a little bit, like how did you, the, how did the process go on deciding on the focus or like narrowing down and cutting things? Like how did that work for you from both of the sides? Organically, maybe yeah. <laughs> it was not very planned process, but uh, or is there any tips for the future game makers, uh, like how to do that more mm. easy easily? Do you set the process process uh, into kind of awareness that there will be cuts at some point? Yeah, it's really yeah. I don't know. Is there a simple solution for that? Yeah. I think it's uh, maybe. It would be easier to have this kind of uh, teaching in the early on in this kind of process. Like I said, there, there's like a design thinking is a skill, and and uh, to to understand how design actually works. And uh, mm -hmm. for example, like a stuff like a, we implemented a certain small game mechanical elements there, and then realized that nobody's going to learn anything from this. But I think this uh, goes in any kind of design process, but maybe to have kind of a short uh, introduction uh, game design course in the beginning of this kind of projects, or I don't know really what was the, the best option. In, in concrete level, did you like have a discussion session after uh, a test play with the different people in the project or how, how, where in the process the design decisions happened? Mm -hmm. Like who decided on the cuts yeah, or we, focus? We, yeah, we had like a core team of three people yeah. with uh, me and Bill and Lucas and, and we also disagreed <laughs> sometimes. And, but then we tried to uh, find the solutions that everyone would be happy with. And uh, yeah, but it was not easy. Always. Yeah. And the Lucas was the researcher yeah, in, uh, Lucas in France. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how did this work for you, Ville, to have two researchers potentially <laughs> disagreeing with? <laughs> because I've been in that situation many yeah. times also in, my <laughs> in other parts of my life that research doesn't work so that you have uh, agreement on yeah. the details. Research is internally di in disagreement all the time. Yeah. So how did that serve your design process? Well, yeah, that is like a... It is co very complicated to have this, like a, when you would need to do simplifications, always simplify the process, but then like a, look, when the process goes naturally, maybe to just making it more complex during the design process. And like, a, yeah, it's very difficult, these situations, what to cut and what, what to leave in the game. And, yeah, we had uh, lengthy discussions, even uh, even on uh, like minor details that on the game design-wise might not matter. Players mm -hmm. don't, don't mm -hmm. even recognize them, but they are very important considering the topic and should we represent certain elements somehow in the game. And uh, yeah. So from the designer's point of view, there is almost always you do some kind of a game, there's some kind of research that you do on the topic. You learned really a lot from the yeah. biodiversity of setting. Yeah. Uh, but was this like much more intense learning experience like in the uh, other, I know that you've done, for instance, IB driven uh, board yeah. game design, like how, comparing to that, was there, was this more limiting or how was, how would yeah. you describe the differences? Well, I think in this kind of serious game, because you, it is uh, when you're doing, try to portray something, some scientific, uh, concept or process or something, so it has to be much more detailed and like uh, how to do it correctly when you have this IP project where you can just decide uh, interesting mechanics that describe some elements uh, of the, the IP, for example. But uh, 
then again, well, there are lots of similarities, but I think the, the level of detail is here is, uh, is different, that you have to have uh, certain things right so you don't give wrong message in a sense. And then again, it's very hard to see what, the, what kind of message do players get out of the, the final product because you never can design the final experience. And, and uh, it's like a, because game is not the main, uh, main uh, forum or main media for uh, science communication. And yeah, I think, uh, yeah. Questions from the people here? Yeah. Okay, I have more. <laughs> there is maybe one for Mika, but before we go there, so Mika's question after this. A uh, very fair question from, uh, from our pre-assignments uh, from the students. What is the reason to choose a game for this? Like, why, why exactly games for nature conservation? Maybe Nina has some yeah. answers. Uh, yeah, well, the idea came in the, the, the Kone Foundation organized the workshop after the seminar on the topic, and, and I just came up with the game. But, but um, I think the, the idea behind it was that because I have done a lot of stakeholder involvement to offer them something new, not another small uh, group discussion again <laughs> with the researcher there, but to try something fun and new. And, um, but it, it worked, I guess, but it then, mm, it, because our game takes a long time, you have to reserve about three hours for it. it was, that was not easy. It's a bit longer than usual, maybe two hours. And uh, of and then usually in a gaming session there was maybe one person who didn't really like to play, <laughs> so that's also a challenge. Right. Yeah. yeah. So some of the participants didn't mm. like want to engage in game yeah. playing in general. Yeah. 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 That's interesting. Fro uh, Ville, from your perspective, mm. what do you think is the strength of choosing game uh, for a format for biodiversity of setting, learning and discussing? Well, well like. Uh, in any case of like uh, using games as an educational tool, it's like a experience that you get while playing. So it's you get different kind of take on than, for example, seeing watching lectures or or reading and so on, because you you actually engage and do actively something there. So there can be surprising elements and. Uh, also, well, this communication that comes naturally during the game session when you have to interact with other players and everything, and it also adds, there can be surprising discussions coming out of the, the game, game situations, but also, like, yeah, you can have all the game elements, the material elements there can be adding a discussion and stuff like that, and I think the, the it's the, the emotional or experiential level that uh, is uh, good mm -hmm. in this kind of things. But the, the, after all, the discussion is very important because games are not magic tool to learn anything. Well, you learn to play the game. That is the one thing that you learn there. But uh, the discussion is important and games are just one, one tool for learning. But it brings this different kind of aspect there, definitely. Many things already. Mika, did we already answer your question or you oh, have? Okay, good. Mm. Uh, catch box is coming. All right, microphone headed your way. All right. Uh, so yeah, actually I was, was just wondering about, for example, the length of the game, but you already did just answer that. Um, but yeah, there's been lots of interesting stuff. I, my thoughts might have been wondering at some point, but did you say that did you give this to people who knew nothing about this topic to play? And if so, did you then afterwards ask what did you learn? And mm. if you did, it would be super interesting to hear, like, were they saying the right things, so to say? Or, or did they somehow have some weird things that you didn't expect that they thought they learned? Yeah. Um, first of all, I would like to say the whole session takes about three hours, but the game a bit less than two usually. So, but okay. the discussion is so important that you can't uh, take 
take it out. And um, yeah, it's very hard to measure learning even by asking afterwards <laughs> what did you learn because you don't usually uh, can't maybe say it and or you might realize it the next week or after two months that you encounter the same thing at your work or whatever. And um, so we, we try to ask that somehow, but with the stakeholders who knew already about the subject something, but yeah, we didn't, that question didn't work very well. And um, um, about people who didn't know anything about offsetting, biodiversity offsetting, yes, but the people usually knew something about land use planning or conservation or, or um, sustainable development or something. So with complete lay persons, we didn't really yeah. play. Yeah. Would it be possible or I is there something in the game that requires that background? I, I think it's possible, yeah. Yeah, it, it is possible. And, well, we had uh, this game, game test session with uh, <laughs> game research students and... Uh, mm. they, oh, yeah, uh, right. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So yeah, we, we have had yeah. these uh, sessions with people who don't know that much mm -hmm. or nothing at all. Yeah. So they definitely can play the game and can learn. But mm -hmm. like I said, it's uh, hard to, to measure the, the learning. And also like uh, when learning a new game, the, there is a uh, lot of uh, cognitive, uh, co cognitive tasks uh, in itself to learn the game. So you would need to maybe play it a second time and also Maybe there is this, uh, if you learn the game easier, then you can focus more on the, on the actual content. So those people who are a little bit more experienced with the uh, board games in general could learn it a little bit easier, engage with the mm -hmm. content as mm -hmm. well. And, and well, then there's the thing that the biodiversity offsetting is itself uh, a thing that is a bit far away from a uh, lay person's mm. life because it happens, you might encounter it when you're favorite walking forest is destroyed because there is uh, some project or it uh, someone is hanging I don't know bat boxes there and you find out the text there that it's mm. offsetting or whatever uh, or you have to make an opinion in your municipal land use planning something so it's um, it's uh, yeah thank you I'm gonna add to that question how many testing uh, sessions you had because this is definitely a different thing to test a board game with a two-hour session than to, to test a two-minute session, like a, for instance, like a mobile game. So how many times did, did you have time to test this? Uh, with internal team or with the externals uh, invited in? With internal team, we played, I don't know how many times, several times we played it. Maybe like once a week or? Yeah, at least once a week, some 23 point. or what, like, what is the scale? Yeah. 20 times, well, five at, times? At least, twi at least 20, 30 times, like, uh, even more. That's uh, a lot of hours already. Yeah. yeah, it is a lot of hours. Like, uh, we often just played the game through or almost through. Mm. Well, you could... Yeah, it, 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 it takes less from us than <laughs> yeah. from the... Yeah. Yeah, definitely. But, like, uh, there's not that many sessions with outside... Uh, players, this workshop where there was this guided play, so it worked kind of game testing, but like I said in my presentation, it's not actual play testing when you have someone teaching the rules and everything, so so there definitely could have been more more of this uh, outside testing and, uh, and uh, finding out how well the rules work and uh, for someone who haven't played it and so on. So it's like a few times, uh, less than five? Yeah, there is actually, yeah, we had a, w one real session uh, now we are with testing the rules for outsider uh, gamers and there's probably coming a few other mm. ones as mm. well, but... Mm. Maybe even here. Yeah. <laughs> if people are interested, yeah, we can uh, uh, organize a playtest session. Yeah, it's four, so four or six people. It's and when, uh, when are you planning to publish the game? Uh, in its full uh, thing. Well, hopefully uh, before summer. Yeah. We would yeah. send it around. Yeah, it will be. Oh, yeah. yeah cur currently working on the rules, and we have a uh, graphic artist to do the rule book and everything, so 
next couple of months, hopefully we get it out then. Mm -hmm. And the website has the link to the rules if you want to comment it and print the game. It's, it's the, the, and the first website version. was um, the address research point uta point fee offsetting game i think <laughs> yeah, yeah good yeah in case we don't have people that can read yeah. their slides yeah. Yeah. um other questions i'm gonna hit with the money question this is like <laughs> a, we always get the money question uh because it is a relevant question of course so can you make money uh with games like this or how does it work, and why would you do mm. a game like this if you don't get any money? Perhaps that's one of the things in the minds of the students when they ask these questions. Yeah, I just checked. Uh, we got from Kone Foundation 130,000, and um, then I got the research uh, teacher substitu substituting a teacher at work, so I didn't wasn't using my grant, and I moved it to others. So we managed this this grant in these in these two years and we some of it uh, goes to the costs of printing and like that so yeah we are not going to get rich with it <laughs> yeah. uh, but we did it for for research yeah. and uh, yeah and uh, so it's not going to be in that sense uh, the money making machine yeah. Yeah. you do have a sustainability for the work yeah. of this mm, kind of projects yeah, yeah. But mm -hmm. like, uh, yeah, like I mentioned some examples, so there are people are nowadays, they are selling these mm -hmm. uh, environmental or co other serious games. So there are some game companies that actually do board games, for example. I don't know how, how well they are doing, probably not very rich either, but uh, yeah, that, that is very interesting. How, how could you? Mm -hmm. Because yeah, the realities are that there are uh, there are not that much resources usually when developing these games and, and uh, yeah. Well, when you could have found uh, like a foundation funding or something like that, Kone in this mm -hmm. case, uh, I don't know the bureaucracy, but is it possible to make it like an actual product and and start selling with uh, with numbers of of the pieces? Yeah, we had to ask for from the foundation that, uh, yeah, we are not supposed to use the money to get rich ourselves mm. with yeah. the game. But, it well, it's released with an open license. If one yeah. of you wants to make money <laughs> with it, it's, yeah. uh, it's mm. possible. And, uh, yeah. But in general, also, the foundations might uh, actually uh, support for open access of the mm -hmm. results. Mm. So it's mm. not yeah. even written into the project that you make. Uh, income per piece. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, uh, I had one more question at least. Uh, uh, uh. Well, two questions. So lift your hand at the, some point if you do want to ask something, but I do have one, uh, two that I want to know. So Ville, you are also researching hybrid games. Yeah. And uh, within this project, have you been considering like an app or mm -hmm. Uh, digital version of this or a hybrid level of the like utilizing apps in in together with the with the cards how is that yeah, well that would be interesting but yeah uh, that would require a whole lot of different resources to do that but yeah that could add a very interesting level if you had this some way connecting it with the digitality digital media uh, which part of the board game or these cards you would put into digital form? I don't know. Well, very simple way would be just to add some uh, QR, QR co codes there and uh, direct players to the, to the website to get more information that is... About the species, for example. About the species, mm -hmm. for example, or uh, different elements in the game. So that would be very, very simple solution for that. But yeah. Yeah, we, we haven't considered that uh, much about uh, how to how to do this kind of uh, this kind of element. Okay, uh, we have actually one question from the stream. So, what is the most interesting discovery you have come across while working on such projects? So, perhaps from the design perspective mm -hmm. or from the research topic perspective. Anything mm -hmm. come to your mind? Well, actually, yeah, I could say that. Um, 
that during this project I realized that even if offsetting, because I have been involved also in real life offsetting projects um, where it, uh, it is often a project that um, is uh, sustainable and desirable like a tram in Tampere and then the, the deposit had to be built there even though that can be disputed but anyway and when it was built they were did restoration for the for the flying squirrels and uh, in these single projects offsetting felt to me as a good idea but then doing this game i realized how it can become a loophole mm -hmm. for for even more development even though they say they will fix the nature that was damaged so it's it's um, it, it was a nice realization how the same thing can be different in the systemic level and in the case by case level. So in the real life you oftentimes only see the cases but in the game you kind of more efficiently see the whole system. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's very nice. How about you, Willi? Yeah, l like I said, well, but I have, I have learned lo lots about these uh, environmental issues and biodiversity offsetting. So that is kind of something something I have learned from this at least I had something in mind but now it's <laughs> <I lost laughs> a drop from your mind yeah. so maybe we can uh, I'm trying to eye on the audience but a last question so what would you do differently in this project if you would start now with all your knowledge how it went and all the knowledge of game design and also biodiversity offsetting. So what would you do differently? Just one thing from your own role. Mm. We already had some reflections, but just yeah. pick one of the most important for others to also learn. One of the most important thing, I uh, think, uh, well, start much more simple, simple concept, maybe just taking out one, one element and focus on that much more, more efficiently. So very general, as in all the game design projects, yeah. start even more simple. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that also like uh, being involved early on in this kind of project could help mm -hmm. us. Uh, because I, I think that that is often the case with all the serious games that there is like a, maybe not that much of design expertise and then, well, I think those end up like a learning project, but like uh, it's not easy to understand what what kind of things design requires, so it'd be good to have a designer in early on engage with it. Mm. And Nina? Yeah, probably the, the same thing because I, because kind of we did at least two things at, two, two things at the same time, like trying to make a r somehow realistic simulation and make a game, a tool that makes people discuss. And I think the discussion tool could have been much more simpler. Mm -hmm. And if that was the main thing, maybe it mm. would have been better to concentrate on that. And we might do that in the future in yeah. some other projects. So yeah, I think that that's a very great point to kind of end this discussion. So always like aim for more simple. That is not easy. We know that yeah. already. <laughs> So thank you, Nina and Ville, for thank an you. awesome uh, yeah, session you. and such an important topic for our lecture series. So yeah, my name is Anna Kasa Kultiman. This was Games Now. And make sure that you are on top of the world with the social media subscriptions of our channels. And we have some coffee at the end of the table there. And the people on the stream have to cook their own coffee again. So thank you, everybody, for joining. And see you on the next lecture. Thank you.